Hi, I'm Tim Leahy, and today we're going to talk about how HIV kills. We're going to talk about HIV pathogenesis and just come back to some of the major concepts there. And then we're going to go to what that leads to. What are opportunistic infections? And then we know now that infections are not the only way that HIV kills people, so what are those other ways? So remember that HIV becomes incredibly diverse. You know, it starts out as that changeable chameleon and over the course of the years, the, you know, sort of the invader that the person with HIV faces is heterogeneous. The, you know, the immune system might be able to pin down one foe, but there's this other one over here that it can't even see, and, and it's diversifying every day. On top of that, you have to remember that that, you know, sort of chasing, chasing, chasing after HIV creates chronic immune activation. You remember that immune cells try to kill HIV. They fail. They and eventually get programmed to die, and then more immune cells come to try to clean up the mess that the first ones didn't clean up, and that happens over and over again. So you're sort of having this process of continual loss of cells. And this has led some people in the HIV field to postulate something, uh, or, or to advance something called the sink metaphor. So the idea is that you're losing a lot of cells. And one of the big things that really sort of puzzled people early on is, well, if you're losing all these cells, and I told you that, you know, 60 to 90% of them are gone from early on, why don't you just get AIDS, which we'll talk about, early on? What, what takes so much time? Well, it turns out that, that it, it's like a sink. So you have partly the drain. You have immune cells that are sort of filtering down the drain because of chronic immune activation and apoptosis. But there is actually water pouring into the sink. You've got new cells generated by the bone marrow. And, you know, incidentally, there is a fight going on against HIV. Some of those HIV-infected cells do die. There is some pushback against HIV. The problem is that over time in HIV, the drain is almost always faster. Eventually, this balancing act starts to fall apart for the person, and there's that progressive loss of cells gets to a place where the immune system detectably can't protect itself. And we'll talk about what it's like to get past that threshold. Along the way, sort of paradoxically, people typically experience no symptoms. It's, it's often asymptomatic. That's why it's so hard to diagnose, and that's why we have to have a high index of suspicion. So how is it that clinicians figure out where somebody is in the course of their HIV disease? Is it early? Is it late? Do they have massive immune damage? Are they pretty safe? We use these two things, CD4 counts and HIV viral loads. So how does this work? Well, so basically what we do is to measure the, you measure the CD4 count. It's basically a count in the blood of those CD4 T cells. How many are there? And we have standard you know, tables for how much a 19-year-old guy ought to have. And so for any person, you can sort of say, is that a normal number? And, and also you can sort of say, oh, wow, look at that number. It's so low. It signifies a lot of damage. And we'll talk about what those levels are. So how much damage is what's measured there. How fast is the damage happening is measured by the HIV viral load. The idea here is this is measuring how much virus is in the body, meaning how much of that pathogen is in there in there to clip off those immune cells. And to understand the role of these two things, I like to use the train metaphor. You see, depicted at right, a train catastrophe. Let's say that was your window right here on the train. What do you want to know? Well, you'd want to know if you were on a train heading toward a cliff where the train is. Are you on a train that looks like this? Big trouble. Is your train someplace over here off the screen because you're really far away from the cliff? Much more comforting. But what else do you want to know? That's not it, right? You want to know how fast is that train traveling toward the edge of the cliff? So, so how does this relate? So CD4 count is how much damage has been done. How close is the train to the cliff of AIDS and death? And then viral load is how much virus is in the body or how fast is that train going off the cliff? Okay, so you know, the, the virus, the body, they're duking it out, the clinician sort of getting in there trying to figure out with the CD4 count, the viral load, when to step in and try to help. And as we'll see in a different clip, you know, we have lots of tricks nowadays. But way back in the day, what we mostly did was watch the immune system get beat up. It was pretty rare for things not to go the wrong way. So what did that look like? And still, what does it look like when people show up with AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome? So it turns out as the um, CD4 count falls, it goes from a pretty normal number of 800 progressively through the course of uh, several years, in fact, on average, to below 200. 
This is a level that most healthy people never reach, and below this level, susceptibility to infections goes beyond what it was up here with HIV, where it's higher than the average person, but still with the ordinary kind of infections, to where it is below 200, where infections that would never be a clinical condition in the person occur because of profound immune compromise. That's why it's called opportunistic infections, because they really take the opportunity of immune compromise. There are seminal diseases that occur at certain levels of immune compromise. So for instance, at a CD4 count under 200, PCP occurs, and I'll describe that. Under 100, toxoplasmosis or toxoplasma encephalitis occurs, and I'll describe that. And then with the most devastating degree of immune destruction, below 50, some of these disseminated other infections happen, like Mycobacterium avian complex, cytomegalovirus, cryptococcus, and Kaposi sarcoma. And I'll describe these in the ensuing slide. So let's talk about what these opportunistic infections look like. The most common one, the sort of canonical manifestation of AIDS, is something called PCP. That stands for pneumocystis pneumonia. This is a, a weird bug that's sort of genetically related to both protozoa and fungi and it's ubiquitous. All of us are exposed to this, and it almost never causes disease in any of us. Only really a problem if you get severely immunocompromised, such as with HIV with a low CD4 count, under 200. You know, you recall that's four times lower than normal. This is indolent. It's associated with hypoxia and the development of bilateral infiltrates on the chest x-ray. And the way you diagnose this is not through a normal expectorated sputum. It's sort of too hard to diagnose with that sort of not very deep one with current technologies. But if you do an induced sputum where a respiratory therapist sort of has you hawk up a deep one after special treatment, you can look at this under the microscope and find it with about 60% sensitivity. It's not great, and so if you don't find it and you're really suspicious, then you have to do bronchoscopy, which is much more sensitive. And if you make the diagnosis, you can give uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, you know, sulfa drug, uh, or other options. And oftentimes we'll give steroids to the sickest patients because it reduces sort of pathophysiological immune inflammation. Toxoplasma encephalitis <clears throat> is another manifestation of uh, HIV whereby people leave at ease out of words. Very critical and hard to diagnose. So uh, this is, um, toxoplasma is actually a parasite. It's something that many of us are exposed to, you know, 15% of people in the United States, 85% of people in France, different by region. Why is that? It has to do with how you get exposed to it. One leading way is by exposure to a cat. If you change a kitty litter, that aerosolized stuff in your face can contain toxoplasma because cats, in addition to being dirty, filthy creatures, have that in them. And, uh, and also raw meat is another way to get there, even if you're not a cat fancier. So many of us are exposed to this, and typically it causes no problems at all, really no clearly proven disease in most people. But if you're profoundly immunocompromised, CD4 count under 100, you can get CNS symptoms, you know, one arm is weak or a seizure, personality changes, whatever, depends on the location. And this can either be diagnosed by biopsy, that's a brain biopsy, mind you, and we try to avoid this or so. More commonly, we do test of treatment. We just give pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine, and if they get better quickly, that was probably toxo, and if they don't, then we probably have to do that biopsy. Cryptococcal meningitis. This mostly affects only very immune-compromised people, although sometimes at higher CD4 counts. <clears throat> they get sort of an indolent onset of fever, malaise, headache, and sometimes meningismus, but it's not nearly as profound or acute as bacterial meningitis. A lumbar puncture reveals, um, you know, abnormalities, but the characteristic abnormality that diagnoses it is a cryptococcal antigen from the CSF. The treatment is amphotericin plus flucytosine, followed by fluconazole, and sometimes people need intracranial pressure reduction through a drain. MAC. This is sort of another one of those just archetypal manifestations of AIDS, a, a dread word, MAC, in the HIV community. It stands for Mycobacterium avium complex, so this is a cousin of tuberculosis. There is more than one bug in this group, thus the C, the C part of the abbreviation. This only happens in people who are really immunocompromised, almost always below 50. And the way they present is with fevers, wasting, lymphadenopathy, and sometimes they're just, I don't know, just probably because of the lymphadenopathy and the GI tract is kind of oh, crampy abdominal pain. Just, uh, mostly this is just a failure to thrive plus fevers presentation. 
it's hard to diagnose. There aren't any characteristic physical exam findings or anything. You just have to think of it, get mycobacterial blood cultures. And if those come up positive, you treat with two to three drugs. And the only cure, really, is to get an immune system through treatment. CMV, or cytomegalovirus retinitis, is another dread complication of AIDS in that the normal retina becomes clouded by these characteristic-looking white exudates of cytomegalovirus. This only occurs at very low CD4 counts. People can present with one-sided floaters or blind spots on the visual changes, and if this is not caught untreated on one side, it can progress to blindness, and then the other side starts to get the same symptoms. And this is irreversible blindness. This is treated with gancyclovir, usually IV, and also intraocular. The ophthalmologist can put a little insert in that'll uh, treat it. What's this? What is this purple spot here and here? Sort of a stigmatizing condition. Here they are again with this. You probably saw it in the movie Philadelphia with Tom Hanks. That's right. That's right. You're right. Kaposhi sarcoma. Note that if you're cool, you say a little ash age there at the end. This is a disease that really only happens at the end stages of AIDS. People get purplish bumps, maybe just one, maybe multiple. This is sometimes just a cutaneous disease, but other times it spreads throughout the body, and so they can get lymphadenopathy, fever, cough, other sort of organ involvement, hepatosplenum, splenomegaly. And this is a sarcoma that arises sort of oddly due to infection from human herpes virus 8. And largely this is treated just with highly active antiretroviral therapy. You just restore the immune system and a lot of this will go away. But every once in a while with the most severe, most widely disseminated cases, particularly if they're not responding to heart, chemotherapy is needed. I, I want to make sure that you're not left with the idea that the way HIV kills people is just through these infections. It, it turns out that you know many common infections get there, either viral hepatitis, you know, liver failure from hepatitis is a really common cause of infection. Um, people can get other sort of nuisance infections, typically nuisance, herpes, zoster. They can get thrush or mucocutaneous candidiasis. There are a host of other infections, you know, pneumonias and other things like that, sexually transmitted diseases that, that are very, very common and enriched in the HIV population, but just uh, are uh, uh, not special to HIV. Another important thing is that psychiatric disease is really prevalent in the HIV population. It's not only more common up front and probably drives acquisition of HIV in part, but also you can imagine the strain of a chronic disease is a recipe for further psychiatric disease. In our HIV population, for instance, somewhere upwards of 60% have had a diagnosis of depression. Interestingly, from chronic immune activation, probably, cardiovascular disease is a problem, probably also compounded by HIV meds. And then human papillomavirus-related uh, cancers, Epstein-Barr virus-related cancers, other kinds of cancers are incredibly common. And so, not to destroy you at the end of this talk, I wanted to make sure you're looking forward to the antiretroviral part of our learning together, where we learn about this red line, where early on in the epidemic, HIV rapidly became, in young people in the United States, the leading cause of death. But miraculously, through the wonders of discovery, HIV has not come gone away or even arguably come under control, but it's become manageable to a degree. And that's why I have hope.